This is Sir Martin Sorrell, Chief Executive Officer of the global communications giant WPP. He's one of the most outspoken people in global advertising, and what he says tends to count and influence the advertising and branding debate. Right now, he's worried about marketers whom he believes are not delivering measurable results to show true value. Sorrell says, with so much focused on how much consumers and their behavior have changed, changes in business aren't getting as much attention. Businesses, he says, are totally focused on quarterly results, and this often leads to bad decisions. He notes, you cannot cut your way to success. And that line informed an exclusive interview in London, which we now play in full, as he reflects on the future of media. We start with print, and why, contrary to conventional wisdom, he's bullish about the platform. The frank answer is that um, a lot of traditional media owners, there's a lot of pressure under on traditional media owners, not just in South Africa or Africa, but around the world, probably in other markets, more mature markets, there's more pressure. Uh, there's pressure because of the rise of digital. There's pressure because their ratings are under pressure, whether they're television companies, newspapers, you know, filling trees and distributing yep. newsprint, or magazines in the old form, not the new. I'm not talking about the new form. All I would do, was doing, actually, was pointing out that there's a big debate about time spent. There's some data from Mary Meeker which actually will be coming out again for 2014. We had the 2013 data, which shows that in the US, for example, if you compare time spent versus the investment by the industry, not WPP, the industry, we over, as an industry, overinvest in traditional newspapers and magazines because 20% of the investment is only 5% of time spent, whereas we underinvest in digital and mobile, which is about 45% of time spent and only about 27% of investment. And Mary draws uh, attention to the fact that consumers are spending their time in different ways and the industry continues to invest in traditional ways uh, disproportionately and this has to change. Even with television, linear TV, we're seeing a gap in the 13 data, it was 45% of investment, whereas there's only 38% of time spent. Now what I was drawing attention to was the fact that you know, media owners quite justifiably say People engage, for example, the Times newspaper in the UK, the average person spends 40 minutes with their copy of the Times. If you look at the engagement data, that's, that's the quality of the time spent rather than the time spent. It's actually quite a deeper experience, whether you're talking about newspapers and magazines in a traditional sense or even in a digital sense. It's a much deeper experience, a more engaged experience. And that's all I was saying. So we, we tend to look at the Mika data and say time spends the critical determinant, whereas really what we might be looking at is engagement. So the, my best favorite example of that is Twitter. We have an exclusive arrangement with them. So we're the Nielsen outside the US. We, we do it in 45 markets around the world. And we have an exclusive arrangement with Twitter where they give us their uh, data, their social uh, media data and my favorite statistic is you have two people sitting in front of a live television show with their smartphones, they're more likely to tweet one another than talk to one another. So, so engagement, how consumers are behaving, is pretty important. And what we might be underestimating is underestimating the efficacy or efficiency or quality of traditional media uh, and indeed live, live TV. So in that respect then, media agencies and the brands that they're working for, how do they need to rethink the platform? How do they need to, well, reca they how to, do they need to recalibrate? Well, they have to take, it, take that into account. I mean, it's traditional, it's, it's, sort of, uh, it's sort of fashionable to dump on traditional media, to say, you know, to look at felling trees and distributing newsprint and say that, you know, that's outdated and outmoded. It's traditional to say that linear television, you know, you look at the Nielsen ratings in the US, and there's clearly a measurement problem in the US. That's why we invested in Rentrac and Comscore and want increasingly to bring Rentrac and Comscore together because we want better offline media measurement because we know that people are watching in bars or out of home and it's not measured. You know, Group M does two, is doing two things quite aggressively, which is our media buying planning and buying our media investment management, as we call it. Firstly, we're saying it should be C plus seven, i.e. you measure for seven days after airing to see who else has run the shows on their tablets or their smartphones. And secondly, viewability of video, that the standards to which video are held are much more stringent than others. Even you know, our standards at Group M or Group M standards are far more stringent 
than the IAB, the Interactive Advertising Bureau standards for what constitutes a view on online video. Because we don't apply the same standards to online as we do offline. So clearly what media agencies have to do is to think more deeply when they recommend a redistribution or optimization of media spending along amongst this increasingly fragmented arena. What we have to do is think much more thought thoughtfully about what we're doing. In fact, you've gone beyond using the word fragmented. You also said recently that your business is in a state of anarchy. Well, I said, yeah, I said that some time ago, and it is an anarchic because, I mean, if you look at the, the, the um, for example, and this was before the tsunami of media reviews that we've seen in the United States. I mean, we have Procter & Gamble reviewing, we have Coca-Cola reviewing, we have L'Oreal reviewing, we have J&J &J reviewing, we have Unilever reviewing. I mean, everybody's reviewing. Uh, their media at the moment. Now, why are they doing that? I think the I, I talked to a client last night actually, uh, and she said to me that I asked that question. I said, "Why? Why is there so much?" And she said, "Well, people are unsure. People need uh, assurance," is what she said. What are they unsure? They're, they're, what are they well, unsure they're, of? They're, 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 it comes back to the question, first question you asked me: that whether they're optimizing the distribution and their investment. I mean, after all, often with many of our, our companies, I mean, I. I I am somewhat amused when a client says to me, you are our biggest supplier. I wish I was because I wish agency fees were the biggest item on their P&Ls. What they mean is their media investment. You know, we, we, we manage $76 billion of the stuff and, and their media investment is very considerable in the context of their P&L. And actually the amount they invest in media may be the biggest item on their, their P&L. But we, we only get a very small proportion of that. You know, in the case of a media company, uh, planning and buying might be two and a half, three and a half percent of it. But what they want is assurance that they are spending that media money, the, the five billion or the four billion or the three billion or the two billion that they spend worldwide. They're spending it in the right way functionally. That's between offline and online, basically, and then geographically. Do you think that thinking then, Sir Martin Sorrell, fits into what is happening in sub-Saharan Africa and also into developing markets? If you look at uh, sub-Sahara, northern Africa, southern Africa, I mean, the markets are at different stages of development. I, I sort of react a little bit against the word developing because, you know, if you look at Africa, there are markets that are much more mature. You know, South Africa is quite a mature market in many respects. They're all mature in one sense in that, that mobile uh, has become high penetration in those markets very quickly because they missed out on the PC phase. So a market like the US or the UK where we are now, you know, went from pre-PC to PC to mobile. Most of the sub, you know, if you look at our client distribution, so we do about almost $700 million of revenue now in Africa as a whole, of which 500 is in South Africa. So there's another 200 in sub-Saharan and North Africa. What's incredible about that 700 million is that the exposure already to mobile and the biggest sector that we operate in across the whole of Africa would be mobile. Mobile telecommunications, maybe packaged goods as well. Packaged goods and mobile tel telecoms, or telecoms as a whole, are the biggest segments of our business. And the re what, what's fascinating is that Africa has leapfrogged that PC phase. We didn't go from pre-PC to PC to mobile. We went straight from PPC, pre-PC, or PPC, to, to mobile. So that makes, yeah. makes Africa very similar to China or to India or to Latin America. Yeah. Many brands often don't get that, and certainly in some markets they are um, prejudiced because of uh, high cost or lack of bandwidth. It's a, being a little bit unfair. We're in the, we're in the foothills of all this. So, so you know, my favourite analogy is if you, you know, I recently went to uh, my wife uh, did a commencement uh, speech at uh, Tufts, and that generation. So these are 22, 23 year olds who are graduating. They've lived with the internet pretty much from the day they popped their heads out of the womb, but you and I haven't, right? So the people who tend to control and have the power and influence uh, over these sort of decisions are making the decisions 
not with the benefit of their whole lives on the internet. When those people coming out of university, out of Tufts or wherever, get into positions of power and responsibility, which they will do in fairly quick order, given the way of the world currently, I think you'll see a sea change in the speed. So there's a Moore's law of adoption in terms of the, of the speed. So take Mika's statistics or you know, the concern that traditional media owners have, that's probably going to heighten, to be fair, uh, over, over the coming years as mobile penetrates even more. And we have to find other ways of monetizing. You talk about unifying the sources of data yeah. to develop this, this real-time dashboard, I think you refer to it as. You've also, the, the, the tsunami of, of information and brands' ability to understand, to interpret, and yeah, to utilize it. It's coming at people thick and mm. fast. It's highly And the truth is, often brands don't know what to do with it. Well, it's, it's highly fragmented. I mean, the world, when you, when you had three or four networks, or even less in some countries, uh, and that the media mix decision was a very much more simplified. Now you have you know, 25%, let's say, on a worldwide basis of spending on digital. And that digital spending is highly fragmented. I mean, ironically, we become much more powerful. That 76 billion that we manage, manages becomes much more powerful in a fragmented environment than it does in a concentrated environment, oligopolistic environment. So we can do much better deals for our clients if we're, we're operating in a fragmented environment or an uncertain environment where media owners you know, are, are under pressure, we can do much better for our clients than in a world that is much more stylized and uh, concentrated. So this is a big opportunity for us. But having said that, the decision-making process is much more difficult. So coming back to all those media reviews that are taking place in America, why maybe our client was right when she said, People want reassurance. Why do they want reassurance? Because they see all this complexity, whether it's data complexity, media destination complexity, whatever you want to call it. And they say, oh my God, am I doing the right thing? And the silver bullet here is you talk about getting people to play together. Maybe the reason I was feeling a little bit uh, weary was, I mean, you know, our people can be so, I'm going to say this, <laughs> get me into trouble, can be so childish in the way they behave to one another. I mean, it is extraordinary. I mean, I'm sure that in the organizations you're associated with, you all play together, and anybody watching this, uh, this tape, if, the, if there is anybody watching yes. it, um, <laughs> that they all seamlessly play together. And they, you know, when, when co colleagues ring them up and say, can you help me on this? They drop everything and say yes. I mean, it, 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 it absolutely amazes me. If we spent... 10% of the time on our clients' business that we devote to trying to defeat strategic purpose. I mean, it's not just us, it's, it's I see of course, I understand. as well. It's one of the 10 issues that we, we always touch on in our annual report. But aligning strategic purpose or aligning the organization to strategic, the strategic purpose is absolutely critical. I mean, the amount of time that's wasted is uh, unbelievable. We spent 10% of our creativity <laughs> on our clients' business. We do 10 times better. Let's talk about the creative side of the equation then. We spent time talking about uh, fragmentation, uh, the digital yeah. tsunami, that kind of thing. But also you're in the business of ideas, creating ideas. And please, well, don't, is... please don't use the word ideation either because no, I think no, it's I the most it. ridiculous word I've ever heard. It. No, it was, it was originally lost... appeared on... Who was that guy in the Financial Times? He used to do that column um, and they used to mock... They, 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 in a mock way, they used the word ideation. I used to read it, it was avidly on a Friday, and it was about this marketing guy. Yeah, yeah. And he always used to talk about ideation. And, and now it's been adopted by people as part of the vernacular. It's quite extraordinary. Then we used to mock it. Anyway, no, but our business is a, you can't get away from it. When you talk about creativity, you tend to trigger in people's minds the Pavlovian response is Don Draper. Uh, in the sense of, you know, a creative director in a traditional advertising agency. Of course, creativity, when I talk about creativity, I, I'm talking about data scientists or analytics experts. I'm talking about media people. I'm talking about suits. I mean, even suits can be, be creative. And I'm even talking about financial people. Sometimes they can be too creative. But, but I'm talking about it in a very broad sense. When you ask that question, or when the people watching this or listening to this Think about it. They think about it in a traditional sense. Now, it's true that that's the heart of our business. We invest $12 billion a year in 180-odd thousand people. 
And it's true that's the heart. But there are three things going on, in my view, that now have differentiated talent. It's, it really is talent. It's not, don't let's call it creativity. We invest in human capital, right? That we invest 12 billion, which is 25 times more than we invest in things like this across the whole of our business, right? But there are three things. Technology, the application of technology, data, and the application of data, and then finally, what? Content, right? Those three things differentiate. So when if we make a pitch for a client's business, it is about the people because that will sell the client on the presentation and the strategy and the creative execution, etc. But there are also those three things that are becoming really more important. It's understanding that that I think is critical as an addendum, not as a substitution to talent or creativity, as you said, but and as an addendum. So the balance in our business has shifted. So if I look at WPP, it's $20 billion of revenue and 15 or 16 billion are in media, data and digital. The traditional business, the Don Draper bit, is about four billion. Are you sad that Mad Men is over? Well, I think I think it got a bit tired. So in in, in essence, probably no. I mean, the, the series that I think never got tired was The Wire. We were talking about it earlier today. Even House of Cards, which we, I'm gonna get in trouble for saying this, Media Rights Capital were an investor in and they produced it for Netflix with David Fincher et al. Um, I think, you know, drifted a bit. So these series, you know, Breaking Bad, I think was always pretty good. The Wire was extraordinary. I was really, I mean, even The Wire actually, and when Idris Elba was knocked off, it began to, it began to go south. But no, am I sad? In a way, no, because I think it was, you know, seeing Don Draper, you know, in the, um, the hippie comment, yeah. <laughs> um, with, with a smile on his face. Um, I think it was losing it a bit at the end. Martin Sorrell, we've dealt with data, we've dealt with yeah. creativity. Um, you referenced we've this other thing about, everything, we've covered yeah, everything. Yeah, you've, yeah, you've, you've, you mentioned this thing, storytelling yeah. or content marketing. Yes. How important is that in the, in the, in the, in the current thinking right well, now? Well, it is. I mean, one of the things that you said to me in the sort of pre-prep is, is it new? And um, the answer is it isn't because, you know, when I was at Saatchi's and we took over Compton Advertising, they were doing those soap operas in the middle of Manhattan, the, the World That Turns, The Guiding Light. These were the Procter & Gamble. Uh, so those, these were native advertising, really, uh, of, their, of their day. So nothing is new uh, in, a, in a sense, but it's becoming more and more important because how can you in that increasingly fragmented world online. You know, we've invested in Vice, we've invested in Media Rights Capital, bought you House of Cards and Ted and Ted 2 and Borat and Bruno. We've invested in uh, Full Screen, which is 100 YouTube channels and a lot of other content investments. How, what we're trying to do is we're feeling our way, we're bumping around in the dark, sometimes successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully, to find those storytellers that will resonate, not just in traditional formats, but in new formats. Do brands get it? Do they understand why this thing, this well, notion of storytelling is so important? They, they, they do, but, but you know what, hap what militates against it in today's environment is there's this era of conservatism. So the average life of a CEO is five to six years. Average life of a CFO is four to five. And a CMO, if you're lucky, is two to three. I think in the UK at the moment, it's about 26 months. In an era, it's sort of like political change. You know, politicians, don't take risks because you know you Gerhard Schroeder took a risk in Germany, got kicked out. So you you tend not to take risks uh, unless you plan it well, like David Cameron and George Osborne did. You know, at the beginning of their five years, got the austerity bit out of the way, and by the time we came to an election, the economy was in better shape. So it's a bit it, it, companies are a little bit like that, but they become far too conservative. Procurement and finance rule. I mean, choosing an agency on the basis of payment terms, does that make any sense whatsoever? We don't sell widgets, coming back to our conversation. So I, I, I really think the balance has got out of kilter. And it got out of kilter because we, we've had very little inflation in the, system, in the system since the early 1990s. It got particularly out of kilter after Lehman because we were staring into the financial abyss. The world was growing too quickly. By definition, it blew up, therefore it wasn't it wasn't effective, we couldn't maintain that growth rate. So we've got slower growth on the top line, you see that in South Africa in GDP growth. You have no pricing power because there's little or no inflation. In fact, there's people are worried about deflation. And the result, people are totally focused on cost and they get to their numbers. Look at Q1 of this year, most of the companies, I mean, it's true that a lot of companies met their top line, but they met their top line by dragging them down. 
and they met their bottom line by cutting costs. So there's far too much focus on costs. So how would you do it differently? You know, this is a very big problem. It's the biggest problem. Uh, I just had a World Economic Forum um, into, in, International Business Council uh, call, and we were talking about this. You know, the disruption to our clients comes from three, three areas. First, there are the disruptive companies, the Ubers and the Airbnbs and the Googles and the Facebooks. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, you have the 3G and the Valiant model, you know, attacking pharmaceutical companies who invest in R&D. And you've ever heard of a pharmaceutical company that doesn't invest in R&D? That seems to me to be an oxymoron. And then you have packaged goods companies, you know, which are really attacking the cost. And then in the middle, you have the activist investors, Peltz and Dan Loeb and Aikman, all sort of bearing down on you. So if you're running a big company and there is a separation between management and, con uh, con and control, meaning ownership, you have a problem. What's really interesting is that since Lehman, the companies really that I think have been most effective are those, those companies where there is little or no separation between ownership and management, ownership and control. And a, a Murdoch, for example, right? You know, uh, a Malone, right? Can, can go out, you know, you saw Charter go for Time Warner Cable this morning. And this, this offends the, the, the policy wonks because this is not good governance, you know, having voting control or having control in the hands of a, a, a small number of people is not considered bigger, but they can take the long-term view. And I think business has basically become far too short-term. I mean, I'm not the only one. I'm in very good company. In fact, much better company than I'm, I could ever achieve. Larry Fink, you know, is the head of the biggest investor in the world. BlackRock has written to, I think, the S&P 500 and said, take a long-term view. And we're far too short-term. And that's made us far too cost-focused. You know, you, we had a session in, um, in uh, Washington with Janet Yellen last week, or you talked to Stanley Fisher. I mean, one of the things that the central bankers, or you talk to, to the, the banker, Mark Carney, they all say they find it puzzling that investment in CapEx or OPEX is so niggardly. You know, why is it so hesitant? And there is a short-term focus, and that's because there's too much uncertainty. So if you have the short-term focus, then what is this doing to traditional brand building? Well, it's, it's not, you know, Jeremy Bullmore uh, wrote much more eloquently than I could ever write or, or say um, that, you know, if brands need continual uh, nurturing, there are like plants in a garden. You have to fertilize them and water them and grow. You have to invest in them. I mean, the trouble is that clients tend to think of, of investment in brands as non-investment, but as a cost. And we have to change that thinking because otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it, well, I, I think the future is going to be, continue to be quite rough and quite tough. I mean, we're growing at about 3%. Per annum, in, in terms of, terms of like-for-like -like growth, you add on acquisitions and currency. If currency goes with us or against us, you take it away if it goes against us. But you add on acquisitions, we grow at about 5% 5, 5 a year, 6% a year, half through organic growth and half through acquisitions. It's unlikely that the organic part is going to... I don't see any reason for upside breakout. You know, the, the countries that we depended on, the BRICS and the next 11, of which South Africa was one, are not growing as fast as they used to, and are unlikely, in my view, to grow faster uh, for some period of time. So we have to get used to this slow growth environment where consolidation will get greater. One of the results of what we're talking about is the clients are going to get more consolidated, the media owners, for all the reasons we touched on, are going to get more consolidated, and the agencies. I mean, you know, POG, Publicis and Omnicom tried unsuccessfully. But, you know, the logic of that actually is if, if, if it was good for publicists and Omnicom to get together, then Maurice and John should have stepped aside and said, get on with it, boys and girls. It was only their egos, apparently, or their inability to find a CFO, which is a bit ludicrous, really. Mm -hmm. It was only their egos or the, fa the failure to find a CFO which stopped the deal happening. If it made sense for all the reasons we've been talked about, it, they should have got on with it. And I thank you for the soundbite, Sir Martin Sorrell, <laughs> in that respect. Um, You've also spoken about marketing um, on the other side of the equation, not having the prominence that it perhaps has. Uh, it's well, not being taken reasons, seriously as a revenue generator. I yeah. mean, that, that, that's, that's almost the a consequence of what you've been saying. Yeah, mm. that is, yeah. Mm. And that's the, the sad truth. People, 
you know, people don't like the emperor and the clothes, so people don't like to say it, but it is true. I mean, I think marketing has less influence today, and I think that's a tragedy, because you're not going to win by cutting costs. You will only win, you know, at least until you get to 100% market share. There's no limit to what you can do on the top line. But there is a limit to what you can do on costs. There is a finite limit to what you can do on costs. So how does marketing recapture the high ground? Well, we, 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 we've got to demonstrate that, that those companies invest in brands win. So, for example, Millwood Brown with Brand Z will, will issue its, its you know, 100 top global brands with the Financial Times, I think now for the 10th year in a row. And we, we run a portfolio. So we take a portfolio of the strongest brands as defined by Millwood Browns, which is far more scientific and better than Interbrand. Are you listening, Interbrand? Uh, far more scientific. It has a more, far more rigorous methodology, both based on Bloomberg data and our own data. And it's not people sitting around a table and saying, this brand is more valuable than another. And that clearly shows that if you invest in those companies over the last 10 years, that have had the strongest brands as defined by that, that data, your portfolio does far better than the S&P 500 or the indices that people use for tracking. So it, th there is a correlation between those companies that invest in brands, that both invest in revenue growth, uh, and the ones that are successful from a TSR point of view. And the other fascinating thing about this is if you said to people who run companies or investor relations people or institutional investors or analysts, what is the critical determinant of total shareholder return? They will always tell you organic revenue growth. My view is it's organic revenue growth and margin growth, but let's put margins to one side. They always say organic revenue growth. What, is the, what do the brands that have been very successful do and invest? Their revenue grows faster. One of the reasons why that, that portfolio of Millwood, Brown, Brand Z winners does better than all the indices is because they've invested in the brands and they've grown the revenues faster. That's the way you win. So we have to shift the debate from procurement and finance being, I'm not saying they should be subsidiary functions, but at least we should have an equal say. And most CEOs and CMOs and CIOs and CFOs are cautious in this environment for good reason, by the way, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying it's a, it's a function of the system as it's currently. And again, to underline the point, where there is not a, a difference between ownership and control, where it is that those two things are united, where management are the key stakeholders and shareholders, it seems to work much better, even though that offends corporate, uh, corporate governments. Martin Sol, just a parting shot as we come to the end of this. Um, the South African market in terms yeah. of potential and contribution? Well, I'm, I'm very bullish on it. It's, it's as I said to you, it'll be about 530 million of revenue for us out of seven, almost 700, just over 700 million for Africa as a whole. That's in the context of a business which this year will do about almost $20 billion. So I'm very bullish on it. And South Africa is really important. As you know, we've been uh, acquiring aggressively in South Africa in the last, ever since we last sp spoken. So conversations with you stimulate uh, activity in South Africa. You know, I'm, I'm concerned about some of the things that we see and hear, obviously, about South Africa and uh, future, future development. But I'm, I remain bullish on it. I mean, our, one of our core, four core strategic objectives, well, you go through the four. Fast growth markets, of which South Africa and Africa are a key part. Digital, of which, you know, the growth in South Africa and Africa would be a key part. Data, we have very strong data businesses in Africa. And then last but not least, horizontality, which is getting out various parts of our operation to, to work together, which is critical. Now, we're the only people, peop we're the only one of our competitors, or the competitive set, the direct competitive set, that have taken Africa seriously, right? I mean, this, this may, may stimulate them to try and do more, but you know, we've got very strong position in South Africa. We've got a very strong business uh, in East Africa. We're developing our business more and more in West Africa and North Africa. It's not easy because Africa, just like the online market, is highly fragmented. You know, people tend to think of Africa as one continent. It isn't. It's what, 57 countries or whatever it is. And it's, it's phenomenally difficult to navigate uh, Africa, not just because of geopolitical issues, but because of the structural issues.
because there, there are so many countries and it is so highly fragmented. But, you know, Nigeria, I agree with uh, our clients. You know, I think it was Paul Polman of Unilever said that Nigeria is the, the China of Africa. But, of course, it is exceptionally difficult to operate there for all sorts of reasons. You know, we ran the Egyptian Economic Development Conference there, Richard Atias, uh, in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh a few, a few months ago, uh, extremely successfully. And we are doing a lot of things in North Africa uh, and West Africa to complement our strong positions in Southern and Eastern Africa. But there's a long way to go. But uh, fr frankly, coming back to where we, what we were talking about before, if you're looking for growth, top line growth, one of the places in the world you go is to Africa, despite the difference. So higher, higher reward, higher risk is much more difficult.